Hello and welcome, dear creatures, to our first sets of talks. And now a quick, intro, uh, a quick info about uh, the translation. Der nun folgende Vortrag wird ins Deutsche übersetzt. Ihr findet die Übersetzung im Menü eures Videoplayers oder auf der Webseite unter dem Videoplayer im Tab Formats. Cette conférence sera traduit en français. Vous trouvez cette tra traduction dans le menu de votre lecteur vidéo ou alors sur le site web en dessous de lecteur vidéo dans l'onglet formats. Um, and exploring the virtual event such as RC3 is difficult. So please help us out. Drop the Herald News Show hints or interesting stuff under the email address newsshow at rc3.world or go to the blog newsshow.rc3world. And we have a Q&A section for the, this talk, the mission of the MV Louise Michel. Uh, there is the possibility to uh, ask questions. And when you want to leave us a question, use the RC, uh, IRC channel, which is also linked below, order, uh, or go to Twitter or the Fediverse using the hashtag, uh, hashtag RC31. That is RC number three, Letter O, letter N, letter E, RC31. Uh, And now the upcoming talk is the mission of the MV Louise Michel. Feminism will be anti-racist or it won't be. Search and Rescue is not standing for, uh, S-R-S-A-R is not standing for Search and Rescue as Uh, going by the Louise Michel crew. It also stands for solidarity and resistance. The talk will be about the mission of the rescue vessel Louise Michel and why smashing borders won't work without smashing the patriarchy and the other way around. The talk is given by a small group of people who run, together with many others, the high-speed lifeboat MV Louise Michel, which patrols the Mediterranean. And now, Uh, let's go live to the bridge of the Louis Michel. The stage is yours. Hello, thanks a lot for the invitation to have a slot at the CCC 2020. Uh, although we had almost no time to pre for preparation, we are, but we are anyway happy to sit here today and give you a small impact about what the Louis Michel project is or can be. So there's much more than could be said in 40 minutes. Uh, so hello, everyone. We are sitting on the bridge of the lovely Louise Michel. Uh, at the moment, we have six crew on board. Uh, and here in the room are Leona, Anouk, Jakob, Laurence, and me. I'm Hannah. And we will give you a short introduction about what the project has been done in the last 12 to 14 months. And uh, then we will try to make a, a slide switch and talk about mostly sexist boundaries. So yeah, as maybe many, many of you already heard, um, this ship is uh, a search and rescue ship. Um, and was bought nearly one year ago. Um, it all started with Banksy writing an email to Pia Clamp, um, offering a ship. And then after a few dis discussions, the ship was bought and a group of uh, a few people um, put many work, many effort in it to prepare a former Navy, French Navy ship into a search and rescue vessel. Um, the preparation when nearly all of them were done in, Fran in France and the ship was bought then to Buriana in Spain and is yeah, turned from a French Navy boat into a pink disaster <laughs> and is now 
Um, again in Buriana, Spain, um, we left for our first mission on the fifth, on the eighteenth of August. Uh, went to the Central Mediterranean Sea in front of the Libyan coast, and were involved of uh, rescuing almost three hundred people. And after returning to Spain, uh, the ship didn't get detained or didn't get seized. Uh, what we kindly or we were expecting this. So we are not detained, but the ship is blocked. And now after the first mission, a group of people decided to keep the ship to get the ship ready again for our next mission. Um, and that's basically what we are working on right now. Like I think a new registration because Luis Michel was registered as a so-called pleasure craft as a motor yard which was no problem at all because it's obviously a pleasure craft and a motor yard. So as long as authorities, uh, well, they didn't know that we were supposed to do search and rescue, it was no problem at all. But after they found out that we are doing search and rescue, we lost our registration, registration and are now working on getting a new one um, to be able to sail again. And yeah, so we are now in harbor doing shipyard time. That means preparing the ship, working on problems, fixing stuff uh, that needs to be fixed on a ship, which is quite a lot. And yeah, also doing a lot of paperwork um, because as many of you also may know, um, search and rescue is very political and there are many political issues, let's call it like this that needs to be fixed. Uh, many stones are, they put in our way. And yeah, that's what we're working on right now. Uh, in the short, short description was already said that we don't understand S-A-R, that normally stands for search and rescue, that we understand this S-A-R as uh, solidarity and resistance. Um, that means, well, what we are trying to say with this is that we are understanding our activism or our acting not as a humanitarian thing, but as political. And um, this is inspired by the central critic that humanitarian work, which is just to say this kind of in short, uh, the other metal or the other side of the same metal to humanitarian work tries to milder what capitalism, patriarchy, or racism do to and with the world. And uh, it makes it makes the shit that's going on looking better. Um, but it's it's making invisible what all these structures of power um, cause. So this is racism, this is death, this is uh, yeah this is, they, they make the structures of inequality and power invisible. And this is kind of what also our project is about, not only going to see saving lives because the obviously the EU is not willing or I mean, they are definitely, they would be able to do it, but they are not willing to save lives or to um, stop people from drowning. So we are definitely, this is part of our project, but um, part of our project or the main part of our project is definitely to put some effort in changing the whole system. Because as Hannah already said, like capitalism and definitely racism, they cause the death that we can see at our borders, especially in the Mediterranean Sea. So without capitalism, without racism, and also without the patriarchy, there would be not such a problem. Like there wouldn't be so many people drowning at sea. And this is that's what we mainly understand what we should do, like putting effort in changing the system. And that also means uh, that our, our actions have to be followed uh, by the doubts and have to be reflected. So we have to reflect on what we are doing and uh, not get 
caught by the stupid game or this disgusting game that is played by national states, by the European Union, or by all the authorities who are trying to force us to, to work on stupid registrations. So what the main situation is um, for us and also for all other res rescue ships is that we are blocked, that we are hindered, um, that the European Union stopped all the rescue programs they had. Um, the, the, the Central Mediterranean is still the most deadly border in the world, but it's not the only death, deadly border in the world. Borders at all are killing and causing death and torture and suffering. And uh, borders are imaginary lines or boundaries are imaginary lines that have been set up at some point and uh, it makes the people believe that there is something that has to be protected. Um, but it's the national borders or the, the borders of states are not the only borders we are struggling with. And uh, there are also borders uh, between or boundaries that we have to cross like gender, like racism, like capitalism, like inequality. Uh, maybe I can hand over. <laughs> yeah, like what Hannah already said, like the boundaries not only exist between countries and states or even continents, but also between human beings, between people. And this is something we are also seeing like a lot on ships. All of us worked on different kind of ships and we've seen a lot of borders, a lot of boundaries, whether they were quite visible or most of them were more invisible between people. And the reason for that or the reasons for those boundaries, I think you said them already, are mostly gender, uh, the color of, of the skin of people, um, the level of education people have and all these stuff is causing boundaries between people and borders between people and we as a political project not we are not only trying to fight the borders between countries and helping or we we're trying to put effort in helping people cross those borders between countries but also helping people and forcing or um not only forcing but challenging ourselves to cross those borders that society teached us to to live within. So we are also trying to, yeah, as I said, help people, but also challenging ourselves to cross those borders that exists in our head and that are very invisible from time to time. But when you work as a crew, they get, you, you can feel them. You can't see them, but you can feel them. And this is maybe something that we can say as one of our main understandings. So we don't see when we talk about migration or when we, when we talk about people on the move. So migration is everything. It's also migration when I move from Berlin to Spain because I think I like the, the beautiful or the warm weather more. This is also migration. And there's nothing like this. And I mean, the weather is quite nice. We are in Spain right now and it's, it's just wonderful to be here, to be honest. <laughs> um, <laughs> But this is also migration. Migration is also when you move from, from the landscape or from the land site to the city. But it's not framed as migration. And I think there it's, it's always a difficulty to go somewhere else. And people who are crossing the borders of the European Union, uh, we don't understand this as, as fleeing people who need our urgent help and support, but we understand this movement as a kind of challenging borders. So because I don't accept these imaginary lines that they were told that they are not allowed to cross. Freedom of movement is a, is a basic right of human beings and should be like this. And this is something that we should stand for. And uh, so then the people always say like, okay, there's e.g. an institution like Frontex that is a policing uh, military organization. And in 2011, they were told to accept a new rule that means they are not allowed to do pushbacks. Because they do pushbacks. 
But what else do we expect? So we have someone who's controlling borders and we expect that these people controlling borders will say to someone who wants to cross it, oh, you're not allowed. And they expect that the opposite will say, ah, yeah, cool, I will go home again. That's not how it works. And this leads to a situation of violence because as soon as this border is not accepted uh, and someone crosses anyway, it will have an effect. And that's what we are facing at the moment. And at the very moment where um, sorry, I need a second, I lost my point. <laughs> you were talking about the moment that people cross borders without having the permission to cross them. Yeah, but I lost it, it's just gone. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> So um, maybe I can jump in until Hannah finds her point, and I think her point was pretty good. Uh, so I would love her to get back to that. <laughs> but when we were preparing this talk, we also talked about um, who was even able to to draw the lines as borders. Like, for example, Frontex is protect, protecting the border between, for example, African states and European states. Um, and but there are so many other borders and we figured out in our heads that it's always the most powerful position who is able to draw those lines as borders and when it comes to borders or boundaries between people that it's also again the most powerful powerful position that is drawing this line and this should be should be changed so it should not be this powerful persons deciding where the boundaries or the borders are um, and who is allowed to live within which border. Like, for example, cis men decide so that this is the border between uh, a male and a female person who's deciding this. This is just stupid. And same for borders between countries like a uh, European state is deciding, so this is the line and I'm a European person, so I'm allowed to live within this line and all of you should just fuck off and stay outside. And you can just put this into many, many different situations, I think. Borders are uh, a matter of distinction and it separates uh, people from each other. So while it is saying you're different than me, because you are male and this is a female or because you are white and it's black and that's your passport and that's your passport. And maybe you don't even have a passport. And um, we, we are mostly uh, talking in our crew about uh, gendered borders. About, and this is something that makes, that makes sense when we, are, when we understand a ship as uh, as a place or as a space of hierarchy, of patriarchy. That is, so it brings bad luck when you have a woman on board. That's the story that's told. And uh, we had this talk also yesterday that we have a funny fireball that you can throw into the fire when there is a fire and then will explode. And uh, there's a picture on it and you see a male who is throwing it like very nice and slightly into into a fire. He's definitely the hero of the situation. As it is. Yeah. And uh, there is a photo, uh, there's also a pictogram of a woman and she is putting this ball from the top into burning oil. Very nicely. Very, very nicely. She's smiling. <laughs> and uh, this stands for something that we are facing when we as Nazi males enter a space like a ship. We notice so every day that we are kind of in the wrong place. Uh, we notice that it's a different when you go alone through a port. Uh, we have all these visible things that we can talk about. So when you have a male chief engineer, it's a male chief engineer, and you can say this is a powerful position. But there are so many things that you can't that you can't see that clearly. Um. Yeah, so there are these visible boundaries, but also like invisible boundaries. So we were also talking about what 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 is changing when you have, uh, for example, cis men coming on board the ship. 
what does this create? Like what feelings change and how feelings change and how behavior also changes? And what does it make with the whole crew? And maybe all of you also have situations in mind when you were only, for example, cis female or Flint persons in a project or in a room and how this was how you were working together, how you were living together. And as soon as as cis men is entering the room, the project, how this is changing. And this is also about boundaries between people, I think. And it's challenging us a lot. So always when we try to grow mostly Flint people, so we try to, to turn the usual, um, what is the normal verteilung? <laughs> the usual normal verteilung, sorry for the English speaking persons. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> um, <laughs> So usually these rooms are structured that if you have women on board or Flint people on board, uh, that you have like one or two and the rest are cis men. And, and we maybe, try maybe also saying that on many, many ships, the Flint person is doing the crew care or the for NGO ships, it's the guest care positions. Like many medical departments are made of, we can say it like of women and guest care and crew care is like are mostly female positions but when it comes to engineers or captain or officer positions this is mainly cis male positions no mm -hmm. those are mainly cis male positions yeah, and that was what i was about to say so you, we are doing crewing for the ship and we try to crew mostly flint persons and uh, that also means that we can open the doors or that we are kind of the door keepers and we can open the doors for um for those people who usually have it much uh, more difficult to enter such a project or to enter such positions that they can take over when they are entering Luis Michel. But of course, it's a story about uh, being exclusive. And um, <clears throat> we, have, we are struggling a lot with the fact that we are still uh, working in a surrounding that is uh, super masculine dominated. So always when when we are looking for people who can take over uh, the the powerful positions, like being a captain, an officer, a chief engineer, um, we are we are having a wide range of cis men who offer their support. But on the other side, there's no one. And uh, this is something that is really a problem and it takes us much time um, to deal with the situation because we want, we really want to stick to this idea mm -hmm. of creating a kind of, a, as, as possible that could be uh, a kind of safe space. And um, because we experienced that the surrounding and the climate on the ship is definitely another one when you have uh, a most flint crew. So there is more space you can give for trust because people come and say when they don't trust themselves to do something or when they don't feel comfortable with something, there's much more talking, there's much more reflecting. Um, it's super easy to hand over jobs when you have a climate that allows not to know. When you have a climate that allows you to be weak, because this is a ship, and when it goes out and there's a problem that no one said like, oh, I made a mistake, but maybe I just cover it with something. Um, no, 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 <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> don't do it. And then it's important that someone comes and says, I don't know how to do it. And uh, maybe this is, or this is at least what we have seen during the last month when we were work working together on this ship as a new crew and with many different people coming from different countries, from different different environments that, or at least it's my experience, I don't know, what about you, that it was many times it was, or it were women asking for help or being less self-confident and trying to like double check when it was on the other hand, like men always jumping in like being much more self-confident and maybe it's for reasons and it's totally fine. But I think this is 
how we grew up, how we got educated and how, what society teach us how we should be, like women always being, or many times being very or less self-confident than men are. And this is something we try to challenge on this ship, like empowering women to be at least as self-confident as the men are, or as the men trying to go, try to be. Um, maybe we should come to an end. So I think now we are at the point where we can talk like a lot more about all these little lines that we are crossing every day and it's not just about dishwashing and uh, taking care of the end room um, we can take talk about a lot about the end room because our chief engineer has his day off so he's not here <laughs> and <laughs> we can say a lot about him <laughs> and uh, but I think for for all kinds of political action, uh, the main thing is that we we have to um, we have to stay, and maybe sometimes we also have to improve it. Uh, the enmity with the circumstances, and by keeping the friendship to the world or with the world. And so we are trying to create a kind of an open space by never accepting any fucking kind of water that is dropping or crossing our waves. So we are, we have to reflect, we have to force ourselves to step about this, or to, to cross these borders, to step over it, and um, to not getting, getting lost or desperated or frustrated. And this is what we can be. So we can create a space where even when we are blocked and it always feels kind of senseless to get these stuck and poor sitting around, don't know what you are doing, because while we are sitting here and everyone's talking about this lovely pink little ship uh, that tries to challenge European borders, we are, in, in the end, we have to say we are blocked. But somehow we also have to deal with this frustration of we have to go on. So there's no possibility to say like, okay, they forbid us to do this. So we can't accept that. But at the same time, we have, same time, we always have to challenge ourselves. And we always have to support ourselves, and uh, we have to we have to understand ourselves as part of social me movement. And this is why we really appreciate to get some questions um, from the audience to get some something more than this limited space we are living in here. Yeah, maybe as a conclusion, we can say that we are not only fighting or dreaming of a world without borders between countries, but also for a world, oh, we have this vision of a world without borders between humans in, in any kind, in any way. Thank you. That, that, is, <laughs> an, uh, that is a nice ending of the talk. Thanks, thanks so much for, uh, um, for telling us uh, all that, and I can uh, uh, relate the uh, virtual applause you're getting from uh, the audiences. You can sadly cannot hear that, but uh, uh, I am sure that uh, there's a massive feeling of gratitude and thank you uh, from all of those who are watching. And I've uh, got some questions for you from the audience. And uh, uh, if uh, we've still got some minutes left, so when you have an additional question, use the IRC uh, link below the video or use Twitter or the Fediverse using the hashtag hash RC31 in letters. So hashtag RC number three letters O. N E. Then our signal angel will uh, put that down in the pad so I can ask the question. And the first question uh, coming into you um, uh, f for you is: Have you had any direct confrontation or other experience with Frontex officers or boats? Um, maybe I can answer the question. Um, so. Yes, uh, definitely a yes. When you go in to the Central Mediterranean Sea, when you go, um, yeah, in front of the coast of Libya, for example, um, you can basically nearly every day see Frontex airplanes um, crossing, like uh, 
searching for boats, uh, searching for NGOs. What the hell are they doing there? And uh, yeah, so it's from what I experienced during the missions um, I went on, it was mainly airplanes that were searching for, um, for example, boats in distress or people on the move and giving this information, unfortunately, not to NGO ships, for example, or informing coast guards in in the way like, okay, those people need help, but informing, for example, the so-called Libyan coast guard to go there to push the people back. Um, that's definitely one of the main experience I made with Frontex, like organizing illegal pushbacks. Okay, so uh, uh, most of uh, uh, of it was plane sightings and not direct uh, mm -hmm. contact with personnel or or uh, uh, ships in touch and distance. Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, the next question is uh, uh, more of a technical side. I think the core of the question uh, was about uh, how to uh, uh, grade situations, but I uh, trying to read that. Uh, To read that out, I think some something is lost in the translation. You, I hope you see what that means, but take it in a, a, a good meant spirit. Uh, how do you define a maritime emergency uh, dash uh, or slash uh, ship wreckage? Do you already take action for a dinghy with a working motor uh, and rescue them, or is it only about situations where people's lives? is crucially endangered where yeah. the, is there some guideline that you can yes oh great what's happened total ask us a question what <laughs> yes it's not our internet isn't it now we can see again No, I think it's not our internet. I think it's just the audio. This is good. <laughs> I just saw the chat explode with all the technical stuff. <laughs> I have so many good questions <laughs> I would like to ask, but uh, yeah. Technicalities are the great dictator, and we are allowed to go f four minutes over, right? <laughs> I'm preparing to go four minutes over. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> When will we ever be back? Give me a go and then I start.
So, second question. Um, maybe something is lost in the uh, trans, uh, uh, translation, but uh, take it in a good spirit. Um, uh, this is about technicalities. How do you define a maritime emergency uh, uh, slash uh, ship wreckage? Do you already take action for a dinghy with a working motor and rescue them? Or is it only about situations where people's life is crucially endangered? As soon as you enter the Central Mediterranean Sea and try to make it from e.g. Libya to Italy with a dinghy with a small engine, even if it's working, it's a distress case. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and to be honest, it's not only if the engine is broken down or if there's already water coming in, but um, those dinghies are normally super crowded and you never know about the weather coming up because... Me personally, I always had this idea of the beautiful central, central Mediterranean Sea with nice weather and no waves at all, but that's definitely not the case. So, um, yeah, I think it's not always about the super dramatic scenes, but as Hannah said, as soon as you enter those boats, this is not yep. a good idea. And and it's it's quite a distance and it will take several days to get there right so it is it is not a, a pleasure cruise or something no i would not say so not yeah. in general okay next question uh is the crew also trying to overcome hierarchies on board um means are they trying to find structures that work without classical captains uh etc yes yes and yeah, then stayed? Uh, i'm sorry go ahead so there is there is a legal side of the things. And so when the ship is on the sea and when it's operating, the person who is responsible is always a captain. So the person who is facing all the legal consequences are those in powerful positions. And this is something that we have to keep in mind. But um, for all decisions that are made on the ship, it's not up to the captain or the Louisette, who's uh, the coordination on a mission, or to the uh, few powerful positions we have. Um, decisions get made by all, and we are trying to keep it as, as flat as possible. And uh, of course, everyone's allowed also to say, um, his or her opinion. <laughs> His or her opinion, and it's going to be uh, acknowledged. But we have to be honest about that. We have to challenge ourselves to to make this running to work mm -hmm. like with this flat hierarchy. It's, we yeah, we are on it. We are far from perfect, but we are trying to improve ourselves every day. Good. Okay, from uh, again uh, from uh, the nice people of the Signal Angel crowd uh, have written me down another question. Have there been other attempts to sabotage your work except the legal challenges of the ship license? Maybe attempts to distract you from complicated work, maybe even algorithmic driven behavior recognition or something. This is a more of a technical question, yeah. Uh-oh. <laughs> I think I didn't really got the question, but to be honest, this legal, this legal side of the things is quite effective. So there was once the question if we can't just leave as a pirate ship without a flag, without a flag, and if we do so, uh, that's an invitation for all forced uh, <laughs> power or for all what is it? Armed forces, <laughs> armed forces to enter our ship, and uh, this is quite effective. And I okay. think the main problem is with all kinds of repression, and that's how police work also works, uh, is that it is not just trying to block you or to sanction you, but it's also about destroying structures. And this is what we have to work on in all the structures we are organizing, to not let them destroy our, our networks, our connections, our relations and everything else. Okay. So the, this legal action works really, really well. So the, uh, I've, uh, I've given some uh, uh, context uh, for this. Do you think that you're constantly surveyed by others so that they can uh, um, throw sticks into the spinning wheels? We definitely have to keep this in mind. Like all the time, we would not 
talk about very sensitive stuff or we are trying really hard to protect our data and yeah so <laughs> but I mean we are not sure about this but we have to keep this in mind or we're keeping this in mind um, and there's another uh, question about uh, about the hierarchy on board. Um, a more specific, what decision-making processes do you use on board? Do you want to give us some insight on that? Yes, of course. Uh, we do have, we are organized with a small crew, like a core crew, who's uh, coordinating and is also kind of decision-making. This is sometimes a problem, but the ship always works independently of this crew or this core crew and the crew who's on board is organizing themselves so they can organize themselves as having a very structured day like everyday morning meetings or try to uh, find other ways to at the moment the situation with the current crew is that we have our construction sites that we are working on but everyone is free to organize themselves so if they want to work up to 11 in the evening they are more than welcome but we will stop them at some point because we don't want uh, we have an anti-burnout policy so then they also have to start later um, so no we don't have we don't really have a plan but we are trying to um, to give the communication to those or the organization to those who are doing it that means the ship organizes itself and the score crew Uh, is trying to 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 care about the organizational sides of the things. That means uh, caring about money, about uh, the registrations, legal, the legal aspects, the legal aspects. aspects. Um, but at least we are always giving a big thing or a big part of our responsibilities that we have as a core crew at the moment. Leona and me are part of the core crew, and uh, the ship crew is doing their own organization together with us. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, for, for information for uh, the studio, I'm planning to go four minutes over and I'm already one over. So uh, there's room for two more questions. Um, uh, after having rescued people, do you social distance them because of their unknown health status? This is a Corona related one. Uh, yeah, lovely. I'm so happy to talk about this. <laughs> Aren't we all? <laughs> yeah, great. Um, finally. So, um, yeah, after uh, the rescue, we um, try to put, like, to wear masks and um, to hand over masks to our guests. And for sure, the guests, they had to, it was mandatory for them to quarantine when they came um, on land in Italy. And We try to make everything possible to keep uh, the guests healthy, like protecting them from our possible infection, but also trying to protect the crew from getting infected. So this is a small boat. We have to be realistic. It's not possible to like social distance like two meters. This like there's no way. But we do everything possible to yeah to protect and, us and, and protect other people. And I think we have to add to this uh, that this corona thing is used from the authorities to stop us. Because they say it's not possible at uh, some NGO ships to keep the social distance to um, ban the pandemic. And to be honest, when you look at the situation on the Mediterranean Sea, when you have the question about drowning, Or spreading corona, I would prefer yeah. spreading corona. Yeah, so we we think corona should not be an excuse to close harbors or to block ships because, as um, yeah, as you all know, treat first what kills first, and drowning kills you first. And corona is quite a bad thing and very serious, but it should not be an excuse to close our borders. And uh, follow up on that. How do you, um, uh, you said uh, in your talk that the Louis Michel is a safe space. How, uh, do you advertise or announce this is, uh, in any way when you uh, rescue somebody? Do you have a, uh, do you have a um, standard uh, procedure where you say, listen, this is a little bit different as other ships or something like that? Or how do you approach those 
uh, you you are rescuing and inform them about that. I think it's not the first step, but how do you uh, do this uh, kind of information? I would just say first that we are not a safe space, but we are trying to get as close okay. as yeah. possible. Um, and the rest I have to hand over to Leona. We are definitely talking to our guests about this, telling them that we are living all on the very cl close on a very small space and that, yeah, this is a safe space. So there's no place for racism or any kind of weapons. discrimination, weapons, drugs whatsoever. So this is definitely a topic and it works, at least what I experienced, it's, it wasn't a problem at all. So there was a huge respect from the people on the move and from the crew among each other. That was great to see. So uh, uh, our time is, uh, time is up. Uh, thank you so much for uh, coming uh, to us live from uh, the boat, uh, Luis Michel. Um, uh, it was a pleasure. And now I, uh, it is my great pleasure to hand over to uh, the Herald News Show, which will be live from uh, Bielefeld Heideblümchen. And uh, see you in the next talk. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.